Hello everyone, this is Coulter here. Today I have Linda Bennett here. She is a practitioner as well as a teacher and an administrator at the Southwest Institute of Healing Arts. You've written books, CDs, and a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being here, Linda. Well, thank you for having me. Tell us about yourself and why you're here and what you'd like to get across with maybe a message. Okay. Well, why am I here? Um, I would say probably the most important thing is that people don't know how to love themselves. And I, a couple of years ago, wrote a book called Freedom from Spiritual Suicide. And I believe that we're all sadly killing our spirit piece by piece. And if we can put a stop to that, I would be, even for one person, I'd be thrilled. Okay. Interesting. What do you do on a daily basis of teaching and your uh, actual practitioner? As a practitioner, um, I, I see clients every week. I um, work with students every week. I teach residentially as well as in our online program. And I teach mostly hypnotherapy. That's my mm -hmm. first passion. It is, um, I can get obnoxious about it because I love it so much. <laughs> and I fall more in love with it every day. It's the most amazing modality. So I teach primarily hypnotherapy. I teach life coaching. I teach some spiritual studies. I teach some psychology classes. I teach a little bit of everything. and. I and that's you're very passionate about it. That's uh, wonderful. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. I have the best job in the world. Okay, so you deal with issues of what, what nature? Depression. You said mentioned suicide. Mostly, yeah, mostly self-esteem. Self-esteem. I, okay. I really believe that everything comes down to self-esteem. Whether a client is there to quit smoking, or to lose weight, or to get over anxiety. So many people are plagued with anxiety today, and so many people have been prescribed medication. Yes. And and not to say that Western medicine is bad, it has its place. And I believe there's other possibilities as well. And so if we can help people find natural ways to heal themselves, then I think that's the answer. Hmm. And that's what I'd love to be a part of, and which I feel I have been a part of. I think that I've been doing this work for over 20 years now. And when I first came to it, I was, the client and I was going through bankruptcy I was going through a divorce my life was falling apart in every which way it could possibly fall apart and someone said you should try hypnotherapy and I went oh okay I guess I'll give it a try did you I, think it was weird you know I don't know that I had a thought you know I have a funny story about that that goes back to my youth that I didn't realize until later but and if we have time for that we'll go there but <laughs> okay. it's not that big, important but anyway um, when I went for my first hypnotherapy session, I realized I was doing this already. I had terrible insomnia, and I had taught myself basically how to do a progressive relaxation to help myself sleep. Well, that's, I was going, wait a minute, I already do this. And I went back for a second session, and my life started to change. And the next week I was in class, and the rest is history. It's been my passion ever since. It's like, it's in my veins. It was already there. It was just waiting for me to get there. And so I got there, and it's been quite a ride. That's wonderful. Yeah. So you made the statement right in the beginning that says, we are killing our spirit. Mm -hmm. And piece by piece, we are dismantling it. So obviously, there's a spirit to us. We have a spirit, right? Oh, <laughs> I think that's we are spirits yeah. having a physical experience. You Perfect. Know? So we got that out. So yeah. There's a spirit inside of us that's yes. part of our body, our mind. We have the mind-body-soul connection. How are we killing it? Why are we killing it? We, I, th I believe we damage our spirit anytime we think a negative thought about ourselves, anytime we do some kind of activity that would be unhealthy, whether it be eating unhealthy food or you know, some sort of substance abuse. I believe anytime we allow ourselves to be in abusive situations, we're not honoring our spirit and not doing the best for ourselves. And in that, we're killing our spirit. We're just doing it slowly. Suicide typically is this one quick act, and it's the most horrible thing anybody could do. However, we're all doing it all day long, and we don't think anything about it. And that's the piece that I think is really sad. It's the slow death. <laughs> yeah, it, it is. It's a very slow, painful, agonizing death. Because eventually, that's what by rights, we are born, we die, we're born, we die. You know, we go through these cycles. And 
So we know that this cycle is going to come to an end, and then there's going to be, in my way of thinking, there's going to be another one. But while we're here, why not make the best of it instead of either just existing or be miserable? Mm -hmm. And so many people are miserable. And I think it's, if I could help one person feel better about themselves, then in turn, that will snowball to anybody that's around them. Because once you feel better about yourself, you treat other people differently. Hmm. And so I think it, it can't help but improve things. So sure. it's about learning to love ourselves. And I believe that most of us start very early in life believing either we're not lovable or we're not good enough. And once we decide that, then we have a tendency to do everything we can to prove ourselves right because we don't want to be wrong. Creating that identity. Yeah, and it's like, see, I knew that was going to happen. See, everybody leaves me. See, I'm always going to be abandoned because it's my fault. And so we blame ourselves for everything. And we believe just because somebody said something a certain way that we're, our interpretation of it means that's my fault. I caused it. There's something wrong with me. And then we perpetuate it. And perpetuate it. And perpetuate Yeah. And that's where we kill the spirit. The yeah. spiritual suicide. Yeah. There's the, the SOS in, in the, the, the suicide. Signs of suicide. Yeah. Are there spiritual signs of suicide? Oh, I think absolutely. What would they be? Um, they would be, well, first of all, obviously low self-esteem. But I would, th I would say it's any way we're not taking care of ourselves. Wherever we're... Again, abusing ourselves, we're using substances we rightfully shouldn't be using, um, we're thinking negative thoughts, we're um, allowing ourselves to be in unhealthy relationships, uh, we, anywhere, any place we don't take care of ourselves. That is literally not respecting our spirit. And why is that okay? Yeah, it's not. But, <laughs> <laughs> but but people do it all day long. Is is it a, is it an uh, I'll, I'll use a bold word an ignorance thing that we just don't know we don't understand we don't we don't realize it's killing our spirit is it a not knowing? Yes, and I think it's purposeful. I think we almost have to experience everything we don't want to be before we can be what we want to be. If we came into the world, even though we do come into the world perfect, but if we didn't have challenges to move through, we wouldn't really understand ourselves. And we would take everything for granted. So I think we almost have to have those struggles to all of a sudden then wake up and go, wait a minute, I'm better than that. I deserve better than that. Now I'm going to do something about it. So I think it's it serves a purpose. So I don't think we can avoid it. I, I think it's just there. But there is a point where we have a responsibility to wake up and go, okay, I can't keep doing this. This does not serve me. What do I need to do to change my life? Not what does everybody else need to do sure. to change so that I'll be happier. What do I need to do? And most people don't want to go there. They don't want to be self-aware. They don't want to look inside and see the, the yucky that might be there. And that's it. So many people, and what they believe to be the yucky inside that's so horrible is you really want to go, really? It's not that big of a deal. And that's what I think. And I'm in the process of starting to write another book. And it's called, uh, loosely a title, but something to have to do with the effect of redefining defining moments. Because we all have defining moments in our lives. And it, unfortunately, it's the definition we put on those moments that hinder us in moving forward. And the definitions we often put on something don't, aren't the true definition, but we've labeled it in such a way that we wound ourselves. And then we live from that wound. Does that make sense? Linda, what are some real life examples of when somebody does start labeling themselves through different experiences and creating identities that are painful that lead to spiritual suicide? I think anytime we label ourselves as bad um, or not, oh, I don't do that well, or um, I can't do that, or when anybody says, well, you know, 
everybody in my family's like this, so I'm always going to be like this. And, mm-hmm. you know, and then just and we accept these definitions of ourselves. I'm always going to be fat. I'm always, you know, I'm never going to be in a, in a good relationship because relationships never work. I, I don't know how to, I'm a commitment phobe or whatever somebody wants to say. And so once we have those labels, and if the, the worst one is I'm not good enough, and once, as like I said before, once you decide you're not good enough, you will prove it to the nth degree. And that was my biggest struggling part of my life. It was that I didn't believe I was good enough and it showed up everywhere in my mm-hmm. life. And once it showed up, it, it, it manifested itself in so many different areas and then you start losing faith in yourself. And I think that's where we, the, the spirit starts to get killed because we're, we're not capable, we're not good enough, we're not lovable, um, everybody's going to leave us, whatever it may be. And we just put ourselves down. Mm-hmm. We don't usually go around telling ourselves, gee, you did a good job today. We usually tell us ourselves everything we did wrong. Even if somebody said, you did something really well. Most of us can't go, thank you. We go, oh yeah, but. Mm-hmm. People used to say, gee, you look really great today. And I go, thank you. In the back of my mind, I'm going, oh, what did I look like yesterday? They didn't say that yesterday. <laughs> you know, and how stupid is that? Yeah. But that's what we do. Just taking a compliment. Yeah, we don't know how to. We don't even know how to accept gifts. You know, there's this great adage out there that says it's better to give than to receive, which is really interesting because you can't have giving without receiving. Doesn't exist. So they're equal, but we've been taught, taught. you know, that it's better to do this. We've been taught, you know, as children, don't get, you know, don't boast about who you are because then you're, who are you? You're going to get too big for your britches and and people won't like you and don't brag and don't do this and don't do that. And so we're conditioned very early on to dim our light, to... um, not believe in ourselves and so that spirit is just getting squished and squished. squished and squished. I keep having a visual going in my head of me like our bodies are energy and they need to be generated. They need mm-hmm. to be fed in a sense. And right. I was thinking of both sides where you have those people that talk about the psychic vampires, the energy vampires that suck the negative energy mm-hmm. of each other. That's the negative aspect. But the positive is like you need to be charged by love, right. by acceptance. And, Absolutely. And we used to use the word in our, a lot of my meditations I used to do, get a love blast. Ah. It's like you need the love blast, otherwise the spirit just exactly. dies. Exactly, exactly. And most of us, again, we're taught, do for others. Take care of others. You know, how many um, healthcare professionals are there out there that are so busy taking care of themselves that are crumbling themselves because no one's caring for them. And they get pissed off about it because I'm so busy taking care of everybody, who's going to take care of me? Hmm. And so that's another way we damage our own spirit by not even knowing how we could ask for help, how we could accept help because we don't want to look Hmm. like failures. So I have to do everything myself. Well, you can almost see the progression, of, like with suicide attempts. In a sense, they they don't they feel like nobody can understand them. They mm-hmm. have no voice, like you said. They have no way of of telling people what they truly feel, and it's just like they're trapped. They're they're killing themselves inside. Right. And after maybe a failed suicide attempt, if they look back and trace it, maybe the root cause was many years ago of not feeling worthy enough, no self esteem, no ego, and that five ten years was what you were talking about with the slow death. Yeah, the and it's just slow building, death. building up to the point that we don't think we have any other option. And having been in that boat myself, having attempted suicide numerous times in my, um, as early as the age of 10, mm. and through my early 20s, uh, I, I, I couldn't see why go on if it's gonna continue to be this miserable, what's the point? And it wasn't until my last attempt, and because I started to understand and research past lives and doing some research on Edgar Casey and different people, I went, hmm, let me think again about this. 
And I realized that if we are going to continually um, evolve, which would have to do with karma, then we got to clean our stuff up now. We can't wait to the next possible time because I don't know for sure that the next possible life would be any better. And I don't want to risk having to really have some nasty lesson another go around. So I want to get it right now. And that means starting to love myself. Do I still have days that I dim my spirit and, and beat myself up? Yes, but not nearly like I used to. Mm -hmm. It's fleeting little moments instead of weeks, months, years of just being miserable. I love what you said where you investigated past lives, karma, reincarnation, mm -hmm. all that. And I got into it myself. My whole perspective changed to where I will ask myself on a daily basis, this works pretty much all the time, it says, do I want to come back and experience this again? <laughs> and it, it actually strikes a good fear. Yeah, you, yeah. It says, I don't want to come back and do it all over yeah, again. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of people when it comes to past lives who believe that the goal is never to come back. I'm not convinced on that. I have a little different philosophy on that. And I think that we can sure set up on some level what we come back to if we take care of business now. It, there's One of my friends, he, he was cracking a spiritual joke and he was talking about the whole Albert Einstein thing, what's the definition of insanity? Doing the same thing over and over and expecting the same result or Which di is different result. Yeah. He goes in the in the spiritual sense, it's the it's going through each lifetime, doing the same thing over and over again, and exp trying to experience something different and seeing a different result. He goes, it just doesn't happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's yeah. interesting. And, and again, doing the same thing over and over again and not learning is another way we kill our spirit. Mm -hmm. You know how many individuals have gone into treatment, you know, for recovery, and you know stay sober for a day, six months, a year, and then all of a sudden they're back there again. You know, what, what part of the process didn't we learn that we still need to learn? And most, I believe that a bottom nine, line comes down to we're not loving ourselves. If you loved yourself, would you really do this to yourself? You know, I, I often ask if your best friend or your child were in this same situation, would you treat them this way? Well, of course not. Then why is it okay to do it to you? But the, and that's I think where a lot of us disconnect. We we don't think about this, and this is home. This is where it all starts. So if you're going to give it out, you better know that whatever you're going to give out better be going on in outside here first, so that you really can give it out. That is beautiful. When you said, this is home, I just had this ping yeah. of truth in me. I go, oh, that's great. I love the way you said it. But there are external factors we have to deal with. There are identity issues. There are people telling us what to believe and what not to believe. And I'd like to hear exactly how we can tackle each one of those in, in a lot of step-by-step -step process, mm -hmm. possibly. So this is good information. about is that I, I believe the bottom line is we don't love ourselves enough and we don't show kindness enough to others and that I believe that comes from fear and our fear also kills our spirit mm -hmm. because then we don't try things we don't experience life because we're afraid so our spirit doesn't have a chance to be in its fullness it's this little thing here because it's afraid Afraid they're going to do it wrong. Afraid somebody's going to laugh at them. Afraid somebody's going to judge them. Afraid, 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 afraid. And so the spirit doesn't even get a chance to be its greatness. Doesn't get a chance to breathe. Yeah. Get out. Yeah. Walk me through the process, okay? So we have a, a, something in our life that is a spiritual suicide. The, the first step is realizing what we're doing and identifying? Hopefully. Um, not everybody can necessarily grasp that concept right from the get-go. Um, for some people, they have to get into such a state of despair that they say, I gotta do something different. Mm -hmm. Then, in that state of, I've gotta do something different, then hopefully they can come to that realization what they've been doing to themselves and start making 
you know, changes to improve their life. So I don't know that they get this awareness that they're killing themselves. I don't think it crosses their mind. Most people don't even want to talk about death or spiritual suicide, I mean, or suicide in general. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to talk about it because it's, it's a, not a fun topic. But yet, meanwhile, slowly, they're doing it every day. With the alcohol, the Big Macs, <laughs> everything. Yeah, or the negative thoughts. The mm. negative thoughts. You know, if our thoughts, we have as many as 10,000 images and thoughts going through our brain every day. And the statistics out there show that more than half of them are negative. So we've got that many negative thoughts, images going through our brain every single day. And for some reason, which I still don't understand, we find it easier to think negative thoughts than to think positive thoughts. It takes more work to think a positive thought. And, you, and it just amazes me. I don't understand, and I hope someday to have an answer to that question, but I don't have it yet. It's wrong to feel good in some cases. You, it is. You feel like that. Yeah, we, we feel guilty if we feel good about something, yeah. you know? And, okay, that's a thought. So if I'm at this point where I say, I'm struggling, I need to make a change, no matter what it is. I'm depressed, I have suicidal thoughts, I'm just all around sad or can't express myself. We have those feelings. Is there more a process then? Do we uh, trace the line, in a sense, back to what's the root cause of it? I think that's, that's part of the process. I think, first of all, you have to acknowledge that something's not working mm -hmm. and that you're willing to do something about it very often with spiritual suicide is we're not willing to do anything about it. We just accept it that that's the way it is, can't do anything about it, and kill our spirit even more. Mm -hmm. So it's first you've got to say, okay, this isn't working, and I want something different, and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. At that point, you, for some people, they can do it themselves. They, there are a lot of good self-help books out there. Mm -hmm. There are lots of good meditation CDs they can listen to that they could probably start to improve their lives. Some people need a mentor or a coach or a hypnotherapist or an energy worker or somebody to, to witness their change. And I think that's an important piece is to have somebody witness our change. We may recognize that we're changing and that's powerful if we recognize it, but it's really, we need someone to witness our lives mm -hmm. and somebody to witness the shifts that we're willing to make and the change and the progress does a lot for us. This is changing. Really get down to that root cause, the, mm -hmm. the, the deep-seated trauma, if you want to call it. I read a couple statistics that said, if you ask somebody a, a question, usually the truth comes out about the third, fourth, maybe fifth answer. And when a lot of therapists, they'll, they'll, they'll say, or life coaches, they'll say, why are you sad? Well, this is happening in my life. No, no, no. Why are you really sad? Well, the, no, why are you really sad? And by the third or fourth time, then they get to yeah. the real problem. Yeah. So it's that person that right. really gets and digs you in. Yeah, So absolutely. important. Tracing the line back to the root cause. Right. And I'm going to go out on a limb here. I believe that one of the biggest starting points of that is when we take on physical form, mm. when we're born. Because we were in pure spirit and we leave spirit to come into the physical world. And at that separation, we feel separate. And for many of us, even though we couldn't verbalize what we're experiencing, it's like we've been kicked out of heaven. Mm. And we don't belong there. And now we gotta go hang out with these goofy people that you know we signed up to be our parents and whatever else is going on. And so we feel abandoned. And I think that's where a lot of it starts. Mm is we don't recognize that spirit's right here with us, but we feel it so distant and disconnected from it that our spirit starts to mm -hmm. shrink. Maybe that's why the Buddha said there's pain in everything. There's pain in this world, and we got to get out of it. From the very beginning, it can be traumatic. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it, but pain isn't bad. Pain... You know, er, er, anybody hears the word pain and they run the other way. I mean, who wants to experience pain except a masochist? But pain is information. And so it's saying, okay, I have this pain. Not now let me run from it, let me numb myself, let me do whatever I can to get away from it. 
let me find out about it. What can I learn from it? It's information. It's very valuable information. So where are our pains? You know, where is that pain? Mm -hmm. Where's that pain for you? And sometimes in the body, sometimes it's in your outside environment and circumstances that are causing it. Uh, and I'll even add to this process is uh, after you've traced the line back and you've kind of identified, I'd also say go out and check out your environment and check out the, the stimulus that's coming in and the people that are talking to you. I had a really profound story that I was about 13-ish or so, and it, it's totally non-spiritual related, but it was so impactful to me. And uh, I went up to my mom one time and I said, Mom, why are we Republican? Is I was just like, I don't know. I didn't know the difference. I had no idea. <laughs> just, it's just a story. I'm 13. And she goes, well, I always have been. And he said, well, what do you mean? She goes, well, my parents were Republican. And I was like, oh, okay. And I was doing some research. And I asked my dad the same question. He had a senator friend who was a Republican. And I found out we were in the most Republican county of the most Republican state. And all his friends were Republican. Everyone was Republican. So therefore, they were Republican. And when I went back to my mom and said that, she's like, oh. oh just accept it and she just accepted it because that was the norm that was everything and at 13 years old I'm going that's crazy she's just believing what everyone else is believing and doesn't even know why <laughs> and it and really got me thinking and we all do that in in every area of our life yep exactly and it's like and some of those things okay maybe it's not a big deal maybe it's not a big deal if you're a Republican or Democrat who cares I don't know and they may not have a huge impact on our lives but is it a model of the things yeah. that do have a big impact on our lives that we've accepted in the same manner. You hit it perfectly, a model. They don't think. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes yeah. they don't think. Well, and are we really taught to think? No. We're taught to do. We're taught to repeat. We're taught to go to school. You, put your, you make your letters. Everybody do your letters just like this. And if you don't do them just like the teacher says, then you get a bad mark. Mm. So then you didn't do it good enough. So we're not good enough is reinforced every step of the, along the way. That's if you're really good tonight, you can have dessert. Yeah. <laughs> oh, many signs of spiritual suicide everywhere. Yeah. So we've identified the signs of spiritual suicide. We traced it back to the root cause. We kind of have a feeling of why we feel this way. Right. Then what? Well, in that, wherever we traced it back to, that was a defining moment. And in that moment, we put a definition on it. Now years later, weeks later, months later, whatever it may be, you go back to that moment and you say, okay, do I want to stay with that definition? Or do I want to redefine that moment to mean something different? Mm -hmm. And then, because wherever we define, when, once we have a defining moment, we live from that defining moment, and we live it as truth, and everything is then, you know, is tagged on to that. So, who says you can't change the story? Redefine your childhood if you want to. Nobody says that you're stuck with it a certain way. Mm -hmm. You know, how many, I don't know if you have siblings, but so often you get together for Thanksgiving dinner and all the kids are around the table and they start telling a story about something that happened when they were kids. And one of the siblings go, it didn't happen that way. And another one goes, no, it happened this way. And all of a sudden you have four different versions of the same story and you're going, Who's right? Mm. Ah, who is right? Doesn't matter. But it's everybody's defining it in their own terms. And however they want to define it is okay. If it works. Now, do you, if you want to define it differently, then let's define it differently. Okay. Creating a new definition. And then that's when hypnotherapy, life coaching, sessions get really working and oh, identifying and knowing yourself to they're a blast. identify. It's awesome. And your book. Freedom from Spiritual Suicide has many great chapters, and I want to ask you a couple questions really fast. Sure. Okay, so you have the first chapter of, or th your third chapter, <laughs> God Doesn't Play Favorites. What do you mean by that? I mean that God doesn't punish. God doesn't um, give certain people gifts, and the rest of the world, they don't get the gifts. I think we all are given an equal shot, but it's up to us to capitalize on it. And that's where the shortcomings come. It's not because God labeled you as whatever, and therefore you don't get. And you know, I you know, 
some people say, well, where's the karma in that? And, I, and I'm not even going to include karma in that conversation. But it's, we are all given an equal shot. It's, are we going to take advantage of it or not? Hmm. So I don't, I don't think I like God's that. playing favorites God, at all. God doesn't play favorites. Connecting our head and our heart. Yes. What is that? This is a very important piece. Our head is our thinking. It's our conscious mind. Our heart is our feeling, our subconscious mind. If you have a goal that you want to achieve, but your head's going one way and your heart's going another way, it's very hard to achieve a goal. So the idea is to get your head and your heart on the same page. Then you'll achieve a goal. But how many times have people said, well, I've done every affirmation, I've done everything I can, and I still am not getting what I want. Really? Okay, let's check in at your heart level. Because that's usually where the disconnect is. It's usually at the subconscious level, at the heart, at the feeling. And it's a feeling either that we can't, so therefore we don't have the ability, or a feeling that we don't want something. And that surprises a lot of people when they find out that they're saying, yes, I want this goal, but then they come up where they, they're weak in the feeling they want it, and you mm -hmm. want to go, well, why? And very often it's because it's going to cost me too much. You know, if I'm really successful, then some of my friends won't like me anymore. You know, and we don't even look at those pieces, how they're undermining our ability to achieve our goals. So I believe we have to get our head and our heart on the same page. Get our head and our heart on the same page. There's science behind that, too. It's fascinating yeah. on the connection. Yeah. Uh, last one. Um, I'll say become your own best friend and also living in the question. I like both those. Okay. Um, becoming your own best friend, I think that that is... One of the toughest things uh, for many of us to do, we don't appreciate ourselves, we don't love ourselves, we don't like our own company, we can't be by just ourselves, we have to have a zillion people around us because if we are alone, we'd really be in a pickle because we don't like the, the person here. And so I think it's learning to love ourselves. And so I think you have to be your best friend. You have to be your biggest supporter and not expect somebody else to support you. If you do a good job, you need to know you did a good job and not expect, what if nobody ever says you did a good job? Does that mean you didn't? No. So it's not waiting for other people to tell us we did a good job. Um, when it comes to living in the question, I live in the question every day. People say, well, what do you know? Well, I think I know right now that it's this, and I'm open that it could change tomorrow. And if I don't live in the question of possibilities and things being different, then I'm not learning. If I'm not learning, then I'm not growing. If I know, then I literally stop dead in my tracks, and I might as well just shut down and die. And what's the point? And what's the <laughs> point? Exactly. So I don't know that you can know everything. I don't think you can. I think everything is always a question. Everything's always changing. You know, when I started in school a gazillion years ago, and what students are doing in school today, hello, we didn't even, you know, we had, you know, party line phones, you know, let me, you know, <laughs> I won't exactly. go through all the things that have changed, but they've changed a lot. <laughs> so living in the question, I, I love the, just the question everything, mm -hmm. I love that quote, something to live by. And you also have a lot of truths on here. Humor is the best medicine. Feeling not good enough is our biggest struggle and hurdle to overcome. We have all these, we, we have the freedom of choice. We were not brought here to be miserable. <laughs> Leaving our bodies is not the answer. And through hypnosis and imagery, the door to our answers are acceptable. There's many more, but how did you come to find these truths for yourself? Living them and living probably the opposite of them first. And then recognizing what that was doing for me and then getting on the other side of it, I think is probably what it was. I had to go through all the opposites of that first. I had to be so out of my body that I didn't even know what my body was. Uh, I think I had to um, not laugh at myself, you know, and be too serious and saw where that got me. So I think I had to live every one of those things on the opposite end of the spectrum. You know, the pendulum swings, you know, if it's so far over here, it's going to have to come way over here and then eventually it comes to a balance point. And I think really what it's about, it's about finding balance. 
Are we never going to think negative thoughts? No, we're going to have them. But we need to definitely balance them with enough of the positive so that we can move there through life. So last question, what are at-home tips, tricks? What could we do right now that are people are listening? Be, they obviously go get a life coaching session, Reiki, polarity, energy healing, hypnosis. What could we do on our own? So changing our thoughts is good. What, what else could we do? To me, the, the, the first thing is to be kind to yourself. And every time you catch yourself with an unkind thought, an unkind action, is asking yourself, why is that okay? And then finding resources to help you change that activity, whatever you're doing. If it's you're, you're smoking cigarettes, you know, that's not okay. You know, there's some people who are going to say, but I really enjoy it. Yes, and okay. <laughs> you're risking your life. Is that really okay? Mm. Is it okay to risk your happiness by continuing to be in an unhealthy relationship? And when we're in those kinds of situations, it's usually because we believe we don't deserve any better. We're not good enough. You have to start believing that you're good enough for everything. And asking maybe the question, why am I allowing myself to poison myself yeah. through everything? Yeah. Drugs, so our and thoughts, and thoughts, our thoughts, our feelings. Why am I poisoning myself? Yeah. Why is, would this be okay for your best friend or your child to do this to? If you can't say it would be okay, then it can't be okay for you. Interesting. I had something happen to me two, a couple of days ago, a friend who went through so much therapy for so long, and we were talking about it, and she said, I went through it for years and years and years, and literally I remember one thing. She goes, the therapist said, any time I have a negative thought, no matter what happens, say the exact opposite mm -hmm. in my head or out loud at least 10 times no matter what as long as I don't believe it she goes that literally in itself saved my life oh absolutely you cancel the thought erase the thought exchange the thought say to yourself that was a thought and how am I <laughs> going to change it what's the opposite of that thought huh how do I feel about that so it, it really is too it's about taking time to be self-reflective and so many people don't know how to do that or they're uncomfortable doing that because they're sure they're going to find some big, dark, ugly demon mm -hmm. down there that they're not going to be able to deal with. They will. 